Thank you for joining today. We'll just wait for a couple folks to trickle in. And as people trickle in, I like to start things off with an icebreaker. So we'll start things off with Amit. Amit, do you have any fun vacation plans coming up? I know summer is around the corner. Uh, hoping to make it to Hawaii this summer. Very nice. And Har Harash, uh, you, you tell us where you have plans coming up. I'm uh, planning a trip to Vancouver and then maybe catching uh, some time in Banff if possible. Very nice. Very nice. And last but not least? Uh, Ahmed. Uh, so let's see, what trip am I making? I'm going to Mexico in uh, next week, actually, for about 10 days. So just, you know, going there for specifically for tacos. So let's oh, wow. <laughs> Well, happy Cinco de Mayo. Speaking Thank of which, you. I know today is May 5th. Happy If anyone celebrates uh, Cinco de Mayo, it is Taco Day. So that's perfect fit. I know you're going after Cinco de Mayo, but yeah, Mexico has the best tacos. So I hope you have fun and wear a lot of sunscreen because I hear it's really hot. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Um, so that's amazing. Thank you for sharing your uh, vacation plans. It definitely is very inspiring. I'm going to start planning my vacation too. So we can start things off. I'm super excited to uh, present the event today, Break Revenue Silos and Increase Win Rates. But before we dive into the content, we're going to do a little intro about Modern Sales Pros. There we go. Um, so Modern Sales Pros, if you're not familiar, we are the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement, aka our Modern Sales Pros. Our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer questions they struggle to solve on their own and help them see around corners they may not know about. We do this through live sessions like the one you're at today, our online forum, our quarterly summits, and our in-person events. If you're not already a part of MSP, you'll be invited to join after this event. And I'm actually going to drop the link to our website in the session tab, which I hope you all take advantage of, um, and also our Q&A, which I'll talk about in a minute. And... I'm pleased to announce our partner sponsor today, Avizo, who made this event possible. Um, and we also have some experts from Avizo who are speaking on the panel today. And I'll pass it off to Amit to do a little introduction. Thanks, Angelica. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Amit, and I uh, look after strategy and marketing here at Avizo. Our sole mission in life as a company is to apply some of the most advanced artificial intelligence in the world to some of the hardest problems in go-to-market and sales. Now, our unique flavor to doing that as a company is that of guidance. Uh, we all need more guidance in life, and uh, our approach is to give you guidance on those things that AI can augment uh, us with and what AI can sort of automate uh, so that we don't have to do that grunt work. Um, many of our customers, including some that uh, you'll hear from in their journeys today, like Data.ai, Vanti, and Honeywell, sometimes describe us as a single pane of glass, and it's a philosophy that we'll build upon uh, uh, today, um, and I'm going to be one of the speakers uh, for the event. Emma, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Ahmed Chaudhary. I run the Revenue Operations Organization uh, group for a company called Data AI. I've been here for about two years um i am in charge of many different things um and along with that is uh the sales strategy for go to market uh, go, go to market for data thanks Emma. harish hello everybody my name is harish ditakavi i am uh, i am in charge of operations and product here at aviso and prior to that uh, was always kind of the bridge between business and technology uh, at hyper growth companies like uh, VMware and ServiceNow. Thanks, Arish. I would just like to share with our audience that uh, uh, our fourth speaker today, um, Alaron from uh, Ivanti, the chief customer officer, had an emergency travel. So he's actually on a flight uh, to Chicago right now. Uh, we'll be sharing some of his story towards the end, but hopefully in a future modern sales pros event, we'll be able to bring Al live with us as well. Thank you for the intros. And before we dive into the content, I just want to do some quick housekeeping rules. Um, this is this event is going to be fully recorded and 
you'll have access to the recording after the event as well as key takeaways. Um, as well, please use the Q&A panel um, function at the top right hand corner. Uh, you'll be able to ask some questions and the panel will answer live at the end. All right, so we can dive straight into the content when you're ready. Excellent. Um, uh, we should be seeing the session goals um, uh, now. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, share with all of you in the audience that uh, by the end of this uh, masterclass, we're hoping that you have three concrete takeaways that you can start applying on Monday morning. Uh, the first is we're going to talk a little bit about how a well-meaning expansion of SaaS tools in the sales and go-to-market space has become a bit of an uncontrolled proliferation. And uh, we would uh, want you to walk away with this idea that you can uh, get back in control of this proliferation. Um, we'll also share a philosophy that we call the single pane of glass that uh, will help you with this proliferation. And you'll be hearing from some of the leading experts in the world, including Emil Chaudhary, who's joined us live from data.ai, um, on how they took their journey to unlock growth and manage risk with the single pane of glass approach. So let's jump right in and get started with uh, some numbers. Um, what uh, I'd like to start off with is that, you know, just like a Jane Austen novel, it is the best of times and the worst of times for revenue technology. The good news is that eight out of 10 chief sales officers now acknowledge that sales and revenue technologies is going to make the difference between winning or losing. The bad news is that less than three of them know what to do currently, and they're not satisfied with their current sales stack. So how did we get here? Um, let's talk about that a little bit. What I'd like to do next is rewind and replay very quickly for all of us uh, some of the key factors that have shaped uh, the marketplace we're in over the last two years. I'm going to start with the green circle that you see there, right? Uh, this is uh, end users of SaaS tools. This is people like you and me. You know, our expectations from SaaS products changed more in one year than um, those expectations would have probably changed in like about a decade, right? So I'll give you a very practical example of this. If anyone in this audience has ever done virtual whiteboarding with a tool like Miro or Miro, or um, you've done any kind of live design collaboration with a tool like Figma, you know that when you now have to do that level of virtual collaboration in any other SaaS tool, whether it's a CRM tool, an accounting tool, or an HR tool, your expectations are that it better work better than Figma or Miro. So what has happened in some classes of software from the expectations on the user experience is now going into all classes of software. I'd like to now take your attention to the dark blue circle that you see here, which is sellers. Now sellers are just like the rest of us with the key difference that they had to embrace virtual selling in these last two years because there was no alternative. And when you go from 12 Zoom teams or Microsoft uh, and Google calls in a month to 12 of those calls in a day, you want to know what's being said in those calls. You want to know what's being decided in those calls. And so in the last two years, we've seen this crazy proliferation of call recording technologies and this whole sub industry of conversational intelligence has emerged. So users and sellers have had to recalibrate themselves. Now buyers have supported users and sellers with an open checkbook, right? When the bull run continues and there's growth uh, that is um, uh, unstoppable, you spend as much as you can spend on technology. But at some point, as we all know, uh, the taxmen come in, right? And you have to start watching your wallet. And one of the biggest things we've observed with many of our own customers and prospects is that the buyers are taking a really deep look at what they've spent. And there's an acknowledgement that there is now a Frankenstein stack of sales tools that buyers are having to maintain on top of the CRMs that they were already maintaining. Now, to complete the loop where there's action on the user side and the buyer side, uh, the venture capitalists and private equity investors and the startups who uh, we all um, know and love, we've all continued this virtuous you know, cycle of, uh, of just investing more and more in sales tools. But as my colleague Harish, who you'll hear from a little bit later today, says, a virtuous cycle can easily turn into a vortex. 
And I would wager that where we sit today at the um, you know middle of 2022 is that we have a bigger challenge than you think you do. Let me share some more numbers with you now. In the last 20 years, we have seen a rather interesting expansion that somewhere in the last couple of years has really turned into this, this, this uncontrolled proliferation. So what started off with this de desire 20 years ago to keep everything in one CRM system with a few other tools became um, a slightly bigger market 10 years ago, right? Even 10 years ago, if you were in this industry, you knew we had a few CRMs, we had a few sales tools, uh, but it was manageable. I think somewhere in the last three to four years, we've really um, reached that, that moment, that tipping point, where now we're just adding tools at an uncontrollable pace. So I'll give you some numbers. I'm a little bit obsessed about this. Back in 2019, there were 420 CRM systems on G2 Crowd. Today, there are 765. That is probably more than the number of toothbrush brands in the world. So just think about this for a minute. There are nearly a thousand CRM systems and none of us know more than 10 or 20. And on top of those CRM systems, we now have all these thousands and thousands of you know, one-trick apps as, um, you know, as Emma the, will uh, share with us later. These apps just do, that do this one thing or these two things. And so we have this situation where we started expanding, but now this expansion has become relatively unmanageable. And what we've learned from our experience with our, um, with our community is that there are new silos and new breakpoints and new gaps and chasms that have been created because of this proliferation of CRMs and tools. Here are some of the few. Um, in this wild, wild west, we're seeing a, a big, gap between the data that exists and there's way too much data and the actual specific guidance that people need at a given moment in time. There's a lot of footloose, like lightweight insights that many tools offer, but very few that actually tell you exactly what to do, when, where, and how. We've seen that as sales and marketing have gotten more and more tools, they've become uh, healthier. But on the other hand, uh, with customer success and sales engineering and some of the other teams that don't have as many tools, you have this rich and poor scenario within the same go-to-market team with more silos being created pre and post sales. CFOs and CIOs usually love each other, right? But we're also seeing that there's a C-suite dialogue where CIOs are asking the CROs, the CFOs and CIOs the hard questions. You've spent all these billions of dollars. What's the value we're getting? Why are we still not beating our forecasts? Um, you know, Emma, um, from your vantage point as a revenue leader at some of the world's leading companies in Silicon Valley, have you experienced some of these challenges and what has been your journey through these silos? That's a great question. I mean, you know, I, I totally em empathize with this because I, uh, I'm a living, breathing proof of this. Um, over the last, I would say about seven to eight years, we I have seen a massive explosion um, in terms of uh, the the single point solutions that are being uh, that are being uh, uh, addressed in the market, right? And 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 these are all sort of solving these innate issues across um, across the sales organization, marketing organization. Now, what ends up happening is that from from my perspective, when I step into an organization, why what, what I start to see is that there are all these solutions uh, that are in place. Some are just owned by a single. Um, Go to market function, but they are not sort of kind of widely ex uh, accepted. But you're still managing it, so you have this explosion of uh, tools across your uh, sales stack. So when I kind of step into a role, what I try to see is that how is that solving our issues? The, the the bigger question, the why, like why do you need these tools, and what is it trying to solve for? When you start to kind of go down this path of asking these questions, why, what, and how, what ends up happening is that you si start finding these gaps into uh, how they actually communicate with you. And what, what you end up finding is that you're not getting the usage out of them that, as you would see. And, and, and the challenges from my perspective that I, I, I always come across is that, how do I see the value? How are, like, how are these actually providing value to the sales organization? When you try to kind of do reporting or any sort of like an ROI type of metric, what do you end up finding out? Uh, that you know they may be robust in one one area, but they are not robust in everything. Every other point, where you want to uh, import the data from 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 this tool to your to, to your 
uh, data warehouse, right? All of a sudden, what you find out is that they don't have a connection to your, you know, API that you can kind of leverage. And all of a sudden, now you're doing, you know, downloading things into Excel or Google Sheets and trying to do these ad hoc reporting to find these ROIs that that you ultimately have to go and see if like is that in driving any value. So, you know, it becomes this exponential like almost nightmare for a revenue ops leader to kind of manage, right? Um, and if we if we st like don't step back and ask those question key questions, why, what, and how, and what we are really trying to solve for, you know, um, it ends up being you know all of a sudden you're hiring people, right? You know, it's typically in a smaller organization, you have only a handful of people that can have to do a ton of different roles. All of a sudden now you're you're like a strategy person is managing multiple different tools it becomes a manual task. So kind of being able to see the forest over the tree and try to organize your sales stack that's going to drive the most amount of value is the right way of approaching this. I love that uh, phrase you used, Emma, of the exponential nightmare. Because one of the things that uh, you reminded me is that, uh, you know, I was, I was looking at the origin of the word silos, right? And they say that if you're in a grain silo, it takes two seconds for you to just get buried. <laughs> And if you are a revenue leader in the audience or if you're a team uh, that is looking at this, don't be that person. If there's one thing we've learned in the last two years across the world in any context, including this pandemic, we're now almost over with it is don't wait for other people to take the action before you take the action because it may be too late. And you want to be um, you want to avoid the silo completely if you uh, if you're able to. So now that we've spoken about the problem, let's talk a little bit about the possible solutions and how to get ahead of these. How do you break these silos before they drown you? Now, the first path that you see on the extreme left here is what I call uh, the, the ultimate compromise, right? You don't throw anything away. Just like those old audio cassette tapes that I don't, I refuse to let my mom throw away uh, from the 1980s. You know, you keep all these tools and you just dump the burden on IT. And you say, well, IT, stitch it all together. I don't know how you're going to do it, but make it happen. And you go through high cost, high complexity, and high IT dependency. You have a second path, which is you choose your camp. You choose your mafia. You say, I'm going to stay in the Salesforce ecosystem forever, use MuleSoft, and you know, buy uh, you know, tools that do one or two things only, and then just kind of create your own Frankenstack in your, in your team. Um, the challenge with the mafia is that any mafia in the world can always put a gun to your head. And so the challenge with the second path is you can choose a camp, but what happens if you're not happy with the camp? Well, it's too late because now you have to almost rip out your intestines if you have to kind of switch CRMs and your entire stack. We believe from our experiences, especially in the last two years, and with the many um, companies and customers we've had the, um, uh, the privilege of working with and learning from that there is a third path. This is a third path that can take the best of... Um, path one and two, but without having the gun to your head, where you can work with any possible CRM out there with all the instances of a given CRM and with any number of tools and keep the tools that you need. But the key to this is you need a purpose-built revenue operations and intelligence platform. And our belief is that while um, you know the category of revenue intelligence and operations platforms as Forrester and Gartner are now starting to describe it, will emerge over time and there'll be a few platforms that um, you know that look to uh, be in that category you need more than that you you need a single pane of glass approach as a philosophy to really help you get the best of all of these approaches um, but what is a single pane of glass for us to learn about the single pane of glass and the philosophy first um, I'm now going to invite my colleague Harish who um, also from his background was a revenue operations leader and sales operations leader before becoming a product and ops leader here. So Harish, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about this uh, this philosophy. What is a single thing? Yeah, thank you, Amit. Um, Amit, very interesting to hear your experience firsthand. And in order for us to actually translate some of that suffering into a solution, uh, we firmly believe that we need to adopt a a philosophy which embraces what we call a single pane of glass. Fundamentally, it's uh, simple yet powerful. Simple because it hides all the complexity of integrating with various data sources that are connected to the go-to-market motion, but powerful because it embraces a lot of advanced AI 
and then offers turns that information that is ingesting into rich insights and intelligence for the consumers to actually benefit from and gain value out of right so a uh, system of intelligence essentially that is able to convert that information into action and present rich signals and insights is what we refer to as a single pane of glass. It doesn't matter where the data is coming from. It could be in multiple different systems, multiple different instances of CRM that a company may have, either through M&A or acquisitions over time. But ultimately, it's able to thread all the signals that are connecting the go-to-market organization and a company. As we all know, uh, revenue is not just uh, the prerogative of sales, right? Revenue means it's marketing, there's sales involved, there is professional services involved, there's customer success involved. So when all of these functions are talking to each other seamlessly and using the same information to make decisions that ultimately drive both the top line growth and the bottom line cost optimization for a company by eliminating silos and ultimately referring to one system of record, that's what is truly the single pane of glass philosophy that we are talking about here. So whether you want to manage your forecast, whether you want to manage how your current quarter or future quarter pipeline is looking, whether you want to coach your reps in, by taking behaviors from best performing reps and ultimately having everybody deliver or beat their quota, right? Whatever it is that you want to do, inspect activity, ensure that there is higher retention, expansion potential for your customers and ultimately reduce the churn. Because in a recent report, as of September last year, uh, there was estimated that 53% of all software providers will convert into a subscription model, which means recurring revenue is actually very important. It's not just a one trick or a one sale and it's done. It's not a perpetual license model anymore. So in order for us to ensure that we are keeping our customers while expanding and retaining and landing new customers, it's important for us to embrace that uh, philosophy of moving towards the subscription model and ensuring that there's value exchange at various points in the customer journey. So what is essentially a single pane of glass, right? Uh, if you break it down into kind of the fundamental pieces, who it's for, it's, it needs to cover all the go-to-market organization functions. Like I mentioned, it could be marketing, it could be sales, it could be professional services customer success, even customer support for that matter, right? A bad customer experience could easily let a customer churn when all the other uh, functions may be doing their job perfectly well, right? So it's not just one function, which is typically a sales organization that's responsible for the relationship. It's all the functions and how it democratizes information and makes it relevant to that particular function to get the right insights and intelligence for that customer to be successful with that particular vendor. What signals does it consume or take into account? It is not just the CRM data, right? It is every system of record that is involved in those functions that I was just talking about earlier. Whether it's uh, your marketing automation system, whether it's your customer success system, whether it's your uh, PSA system for that matter, every system that is part of that go-to-market journey from a customer standpoint, right? Essentially, it needs to be able to bring all of that rich information in and then be able to use that to convert that into intelligence and insights. Of course, users today are very much mobile, even though COVID has kind of put a halt to that, right? Users are able to consume information in a variety of devices and on a variety of uh, form factors as well. So what this single pane of glass needs to be able to do is to provide and meet users where they are. It's not just web and mobile. That was kind of the 2000s kind of the paradigm, right? It is now, there's metaverse, there's information uh, on social media, right? It's all of that needs to be able to follow users where they are. And that is where the full power of ML and AI comes into the picture. Because how do you turn raw data and in lots of gigabytes and petabytes of information into rich insights. That's where you apply the full power of AI, advanced machine learning techniques, whether it's uh, natural language processing, computer vision, or predicting forecasting, whatever the uh, models and the techniques that you have need to be working in collision and in unison with each other, and then being able to create that outcome that users are looking for. They don't care about how the sausage is made as long as they get value from that. 
And that's very important from a sales or from a go-to-market perspective. It's not the most advanced model being used. It's the most value that they're getting out of that particular investment that they're making. And then any, any real system of intelligence needs to work across different industries, different markets, different verticals, right? It's not just in the high-tech B2B SaaS space. It could be manufacturing, it could be pharmaceuticals, it could be financial services. So it needs to learn and adapt itself to those various changing business paradigms. But ultimately, the value that it generates is measured in two ways, top line revenue growth or bottom line cost optimization, as simple as that. If it doesn't do either of those, then it's not truly a single pane of glass that's offering value to our customers. So in terms of, was there a question? Sorry. No, it's a great point. Makes sense. Yep. In terms of uh, the personas that it needs to cater to, right? Uh, obviously, there is various levels of uh, people and various functions within the enterprise that are requesting and demanding for richer insights and guidance, especially, right? Uh, a single pane of glass philosophy is essentially the platform or the approach that you take is essentially needs to guide the person that is consuming the information and realize better outcomes for them and the organization as a whole. So whether it's uh, the reps or the managers or even go to market functions across the company, right? Everybody uh, has to have information that is tailored for them. And the where most tools today fall short is they only serve one set of the audience, whether it's the actual finance teams or the management layer, ignoring the bunch of reps, the underlying quota carrying sellers that actually are driving outcomes and moving deals forward. So this is where it needs to be persona driven and the democratization of the data, which is all data relevant to the business. Right? You, like I was saying before, data is generated across multiple various functions we need to be able to bring all of that together, whether it's the deals, whether it's forecasts, whether it's the activities, the call recordings, and the corresponding analysis of that, as well as even the reporting and dashboarding that any uh, CRM system is able to offer, right? How do we thread all of this information together and provide rich analytics that ultimately help in decision making and driving value to our customers? Reps, they are great at pursuing deals, but we all know that they're not great at actually capturing the true state of the deal at any point in time in the CRM system, right? They only do it because the manager forces them to do that, right? And it becomes more of a, I'm doing it because he or she asked me to do it, right? So how do we put the onus back on this platform or the technology to make it easier for them to reflect what is really happening on the deal? And that is through nudges. We believe in the concept of nudges, right? It's nudging people to take action at the right time, either to realize better outcomes or to mitigate potential risk. Either of those outcomes are actually good because we know that the deal is moving forward. And it also helps with uh, managers because they know that the right action is being taken. They're able to coach reps, guide them, and ensure that the behaviors that the best performing reps are doing are easily understood and being replicated across the rest of the organization to bring everybody uh, to the same level. So that is where the information that we have is uh, handy. Now, on this particular thing, right? The if you go back one slide, uh, Amit, if you don't mind, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like I was saying before, the a lot of tools that we have in the marketplace today work with only one CRM uh, system, right? And that is actually where the silos get created because each CRM solution may have its own uh, ecosystem of tools that are specific to that particular problem that they're trying to solve. As you mentioned, it's a one trick, so one so app solution that is uh, causing those silos to be exacerbated and causing that problem that Amit was referring to, which is the vortex that uh, we was talking about before, right? Now, as we know, upsells and renewals are key to any subscription business, right? What does a single pane of glass do differently from those other solutions is to be able to ingest data from any other system 
and understand what is specifically happening like what has happened in the past and how does it affect the present and the future right the, that is where the time series element comes into the picture without understanding what has happened in the past and what is the likelihood of a particular deal closing in on time or in the expected manner right it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future right so we need to look at the past in order to be to be able to predict the future with a high degree of accuracy and the way we do that is we need to look at uh, advanced nlp machine learning and ai techniques in order for us to ensure that we have the right information and the intelligence being generated so next slide is more of a visual on uh, how a single pane of glass looks at it looks at various uh, systems and various sources across the way i'm not going to go into much detail on this but uh, the key takeaway on this is all the touch points that we have in the customer journey we are able to consume and offer through this philosophy called the single pane of glass which ultimately makes the user where they are in a variety of form factors so amit i will now hand it back to both uh, you and amit this sounds too, too too good to be true is this even real right so just what i wanted to uh, find out more if it's actually something that can be uh, implemented for real and i think this is a really good uh, kind of segue into the question of you know is this a real car or is this a flying car and we're uh, actually uh, you know it's, it's definitely a privilege to have you know a couple of minutes more with uh, you know with emma uh, who is uh, the global leader uh, for revenue operations at data.ai the company formerly known as uh, app ani both lovely names and you know if you've been in the uh, in the industry in analytics in mobility big data or ai you've probably heard about the organization um, you know used by over 90% of the top 100 publishers hundreds and thousands of apps and uh, you know, you can certainly you should look up um, how um, uh, app data and ai um, you know serves the industry the main thing that i'd like to point out before i start asking amazon no questions is that this is a global company with global scale revenue operations challenges and uh, um works at a large system of scale so you know so emma um, as we talk about your journey with data.ai i'd love to just start with what was the environment like when you got there and what were some of the opportunities you saw in your first few months on what you could do differently with revenue operations there with technology thanks for the question amit i think uh, and uh, thanks for your introduction as well you know coming into and i joined uh, data ai uh, right about 2 years ago and one of the biggest challenges i had stepping into it uh what i saw was there are a ton of tools right uh, from from sdr organization from the ae organization to to the csm um and 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 we were trying to use this in a silo way and then 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 ultimately if you wanted to gain insight there was just not much you can glean from it and if you kind of take a step back and look at the forest over the tree for me from the sales organization perspective there are three big component that i look at one is how much activity you're doing and the activity leads to pipeline and then if you have enough pipeline then eventually we'll get to close one at a 30000 foot view level and and i started to plug in all the different tools that we, that i have in that in that area all ended up being about 6 to 8 different tools just in that area to answer questions and when i took a step step back and tried to see what how is the the sales organization performing against all of those it was very hard to glean that information because all of a sudden you have solid information and nothing is being piped into your your data warehouse and you're trying to if they are you're trying to connect the point i ended up having uh i inherited about two different data engineers just in my revenue operations team just to kind of unwind this information it was a massive challenge right so take once again taking a step back and i saw a massive opportunity here uh to really improve um in terms of once again looking at the activity the pipeline and close one um those three critical areas i started looking at tools that can help me solve this issue right like you know uh, and that's one of the reason um i started speaking with aviso um the reason it's really interesting and it it really kind of connects the dot for me i can everything can get tied back to my forecasting right and how accurate the forecasting is so essentially you have your activity and we we gain that activity information through through a viso <clears throat> and i can tell if there's enough activity that's happening from reps perspective then are you generating in a pipeline 
So once you know that, that's great. Uh, is it against the target that you have set up for yourself? And then you have uh, the close one. Obviously, we're tracking how much you're closing. But what's interesting for me is the distance between pipeline and close one, right? Mm -hmm. If you're forecasting items and you're forecast, then is it real or not? And we can manage the, the, the sales process and methodologies within the, with the tool. So all of a sudden, I was able, at least for the, the direct sales organization, I was able to connect the three dots very quickly. It's a really interesting uh, kind of uh, um, approach that uh, you describe where without solving the forecasting and pipeline <laughs> management problem, you can solve other pieces around it, but you don't get that predictability. And um, I'm uh, just curious, based on your experience with uh, the single pane of glass approach, uh, what are some of the benefits you've seen and what are you most excited about, about next? Uh, that's a great question as well. Um, from single pane of glass, so it's kind of going back to my earlier question. It's just, you know, you have to see the, the problem from a 30,000 foot view, right? Then you can kind of start solving this issue. Um, from, from a visa standpoint right now, um, what I'm able to really get deep into in a conversation is forecast accuracy. So if someone's committing a deal, is it truly a salesperson can tell you that and uh, that, hey, this is this is a sure deal. I'm committing to it, written blood, all those sales conversation we get into. And then it's easy to kind of get be convinced by it. But through data, now I can tell if this deal is multi-threaded or single threaded in that same conversation. I, because I know the truth because I'm looking at it from a visa. Um, are they following the right medic, medic methodology? Are they following the sales, sales process? What is the behavior of this rep? What percentage of the deals that they commit typically moves in and out of a quarter? So you can gain those insights and then assess a deal risk very quickly in one conversation, right? You can get deeper into the calls they are having, right? You can get the assessment of those deals. So having that, that full-fledged discussion in one from a single uh, tool has made a phenomenal change on our in our culture. Um, it's really truly driving our um, operational cadence that we have set up in the right way, and we are more efficient about getting to the details. Um, and I can sit down and have a discussion with our CRO and our CEO and our e staff about our forecast accuracy and and feel very confident about uh, the insights we are gleaning. Thank you uh, so much for sharing that perspective, Ahmed. Uh, it uh, sounds like whether we use the analogy of a really sophisticated electric car or a flying car, that the car is safe, uh, it's being tested, and uh, a lot um, more um, uh, of, um, you know, as we get more data, and as, uh, you know, more and more new and younger sellers enter the profession, we have the opportunity to provide the next generation of, of, of sales and go-to-market teams, uh, which is a better experience you know, overall, you know, love how you described the 30,000 foot view and, and tying the technology back to strategy. Um, uh, building upon what Emma has shared with us, um, I would like to uh, also just uh, bring to our audience's attention one more uh, story um, that um, I don't, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the, uh, the story just at a high level. Um, and we would then invite you to, uh, you know, certainly learn from the Ivanti journey through some of the assets that uh, modern sales pros uh, and this will be sharing through this event, but also as a follow-up. And this is a journey of a company called Ivanti. It's a very different journey from data, you know, AI in the sense that Ivanti is a is an older organization, 37 years old, and has, um, you know, they own companies like Mobileye and others that you may have heard of in um, the intersection of asset management, endpoint management, identity, and such. Uh, now, Al, um, uh, uh, who um, is on, on a flight to Chicago as we speak, is the chief customer officer there. And... Um, um, one of the biggest things that um, Ivanti was really facing is that in order to keep growing as fast as it's grown, I mean, they're nearly at about 50,000 customers now, they've done a lot of acquisitions. And they're to support both organic growth as well as mergers and acquisitions. And similar to the challenges that Emma described, um, uh, they faced uh, those challenges and additional ones like having different geos around the world, which had their own CRM instances, you know, with some data in Microsoft Dynamics, some data in, uh, you know, in Salesforce. And uh, after struggling with some other alternative tools, which simply broke down when Ivanti wanted to stitch together this philosophy of a single pane of glass, 
um, uh, we um, uh, engage with them on the single pane of glass philosophy. Um, uh, I uh, will not be able to do as much justice as you hearing directly from Al. So, um, you know, um, if the uh, video link has not been shared in the common you know, chat yet, then I invite you to uh, go to our Aviso uh, website and blog and uh, actually hear some of Al's videos himself to hear a, a different uh, and complementary perspective to Ahmed. Um, Harish, uh, from where you sit, having been so closely involved in both the product and the deployment side of Devanti, is there anything else you'd like to share before we take it home with some uh, takeaways for our audience and open it up to um, any questions? One of the key things that uh, we did for Ivanti uh, during the implementation phase was to identify the right sources of that information, right? As you mentioned, they are a very uh, acquisitive company. So they have actually have multiple instances of the same CRM sitting in different places through those acquisitions and just evolving over time. So what Visa was able to do for them was to create that one single, true single pane of glass by consolidating information from multiple CRM systems, not just one way, right? Not just providing that information in a visa and providing the rich AI insights, but even allowing users to consume the information that they have access to through that particular point of view for a specific user, and then also allowing them to write information back to the corresponding CRM, which hasn't, uh, not many uh, solutions out there have the ability to do that at a scale like Ivanti's, right? So that's something that we uh, discovered uh, that Aviso was able to use that uh, powerful platform to be able to solve that uh, valuable business case and uh, drive better outcomes for Ivanti right from the get-go. Thank you, Arish. So uh, uh, you know, for our audience uh, in Modern Sales for the community, uh, you now heard about a single pane of glass philosophy the problems that can either solve for you in your Frankenstein stack today, or the problems you're going to avoid in the future by embracing such a philosophy. Uh, you've heard from two companies um, uh, in two different perspectives on, on how this is real. Companies are using it. Um, I'd like to bring us home um, before we open up for Q&A. This is the video we were going to play for you uh, that uh, Angelica has put the link on uh, in the sessions tab. Uh, we invite you to take a look at this and actually see some of the other AL videos. Um, I'd bring us home with some things you can do on Monday morning. And, you know, uh, Emma, if you have any other thoughts to share with our audience on, on best practices they can apply from your learnings, we'd love to hear those. But we, we'd encourage you to start with a, with a light audit, like, you know, kind of, you know, like I did an audit recently on my HBO and Hulu and YouTube and figured out I was spending way more money than I needed to on all these, um, on the, all these personal subscriptions. Try to see what's under the hood, at what cost, how many of these tools, and what value are they driving to Emma's earlier point. Um, identify some low-hanging fruits, but be specific about what that low-hanging fruit is. And we'd, um, we'd um, building upon Ahmed's earlier point, if you can solve the forecasting problem with tools that are proven to give you near 100% forecasting, then start with that because predictability solves a lot of other problems. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the big elephant in the room. Um, and uh, learn from other leading companies that have already paved the path towards um, uh, the the idea of a single pane of glass. It's not a destination. It's a journey and a philosophy that will constantly keep growing as you keep growing. Um, Emma, any, any other thoughts you'd like to share for anyone that's looking for some Monday morning thinking around this problem uh, when they when they consume this uh, this uh, masterclass? No, I think uh, you you guys have said it really well uh, from the from the single pane of pain view. So, one of I mean, ultimately. If we are trying to, I mean, if you're trying to solve a problem here, right? Like, and then there are multiple problems, multiple different types of problems we have to solve for, from revenue operations perspective. We have to always take it back to the the, the question of: Are we driving what kind of value we're driving for sales? Right. It's so ultimately it's efficiency, accuracy is is what we are, we what we want to get to, and if those are the high level questions, please like you know tie in. Uh, the, the 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 company vision to to what you're doing and ultimately you know asking those questions 30,000 foot view why what and how right looking into from sales perspective like a uh, look at the like break things down to different buckets activity pipeline close one and how are you sort of answering those questions and how are you connecting the dot in between those 
those journeys, right? And if you're able to do that um, with the, with the, with data and tool, like you know, you know, less tools, it's going to make things a lot more efficient um, um, and 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 an inexpensive tech stack, right? Um, and it's going to sort of give time back to you ultimately, right? And the 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 other comment to the group would be that there are two books that sort of help me think about these 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 ways. It's a uh, um, that's one is uh, one is five dysfunctions of a team, and the other one is um, uh, ideal team player. So it like you know those things they talk about different concepts, and you can kind of sort of gain a lot of insights in terms of how you even attack a problem, or how you solve for it. So um, anyhow, those are some some insights for me. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, masterclass presentation that uh, you know we had prepared for. You know this audience. Um, if there are uh, any questions um, uh, that uh, you'd like to post, um, you know, if uh, based on the materials you've heard, um, we'll be tracking the the Q and A for the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, and um, Angelica is going to be coming back uh, online to help us take the presentation home. Um, let me quickly see if there are any uh, questions that we can quickly get some answers to uh, before we uh, before we uh, converge this uh, masterclass. Emil, one of the interesting questions that uh, I'm seeing, uh, whether if you or Harish have a perspective on this, is prioritization, right? Let's say if you're not doing conversational intelligence today or or, or relationship intelligence, you're not doing any of it. You're just doing some like basic uh, forecasting on a spreadsheet on top of CRM. Um, where do you start? Do you like? Do you have the luxury of taking a, a manual approach and saying, "I want to do this six months, then do this six months, then six months," or really, given the nature of the market we're in? Do you want to go uh, across the board uh, at the same time, uh, especially if you're still stuck in the world of spreadsheets? If you're stuck in the world of spreadsheets, um, I think um, it just puts you in a disadvantage, right? And it's all about, once again, just tying to the vision of where we want to go as a revenue ops organization, right? What are some of the deficiencies that we want to bring back to it? So it, it goes back to the go-to-market strategy that we set up based on the vision of the sales organization, right? Um, and then we have to prioritize our our um, our workload behind it. Essentially, if 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 that's the direction we need to go to, then we have to put a put a plan in place, and we have to uh, go through the due diligence uh, in terms of what we need to achieve by it. Right by by being organized, by by thinking through the the why, what, and how. Right, but it it always ties back to the vision of the company, the sales organization, and then prioritizing our strategies behind that, right? Otherwise, it's always very difficult to do it from bottoms up. It's like, if I feel the need for it and there's not a need from the sales organization, then you're already misaligned and it's not gonna go anywhere. So right. so aligning the vision and then sort of, you know, there's a little bit of um, upward management that we have to do sometimes, right? Which, which, is, which is part of the role. That's the, the craft that we have to kind of hone in. But once we can do that, then you can prioritize the work that you need to focus on. Let that be, you know, uh, con, con, uh, conversational intelligence or what have you, right? Um, uh, product analytics, what, what different areas, right? That you want to drive efficiency, but you have to align that. That's great. And, you know, just to like take us home um, uh, as we close this presentation today, I invite um, you to um, uh, go to the Aviso YouTube. Uh, you know, we've uh, you know recently de de done a series of uh, such conversations with uh, with Emil about you know his journey and his philosophy, um, and uh, we know where he gets his inspirations from. And we run something similar with Al. We invite you to take a look at those. Um, I am going to take us to the uh, to the last uh, slide here, um, and. Uh, I would uh, like to invite Angelica back. Uh, you know, thanks again for being a host today, Angelica. Thank you all. This was such an amazing session. Thank you everyone today for today um, for attending today's event, and thank you Aviso, our wonderful speakers, for your time today. Lots of great information. Some quick reminders that the recordings and key takeaways will be available on our website, and don't forget to check out our upcoming events. So I hope to see you there, and have a great day. Thank you, Angelica.